you don't turn it on, it's not really on. I hear music. Now I hear music. Well, it's good to see you this morning. I'm glad that you've come to church. Uh, just a few announcements uh, before we begin today. Uh, and really, this time, I'm actually telling the truth. Just a few. Uh, just want to invite you again Wednesday nights at 6 o'clock to our uh, study on 1 Peter. That is... Uh, and I've enjoyed it the first couple of weeks. It's been really good. And uh, it goes great with our morning series because we've been talking a lot in the last few weeks about Peter. And we see him on this side of Pentecost. And then on Wednesday nights, we see what happened to him. And so uh, that would be good for you. Uh, also, Ladies' Day, if you're interested in uh, going to that or more information about that, see Rachel. Also, the information that's on that poster is on the website. So if you go to uh, taylorvillenaz.org, you can find that. And then on March 20th, right here, that's a, uh, that's a Sunday, but on Sunday night at 6 o'clock, we're going to have our uh, Springfield District Zone, no, Springfield Zone Mission Round. And uh, we have some missionaries coming in. There's a poster in the front, a poster back here. Uh, it's, telling about the, the uh, missionary that will be here to speak to us that night. So I'd like for you to make plans being here then. Well, let's uh, stand and get ready to sing this morning. As we, let's, we'll, we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll sing, okay? Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for... The chance to be together, Lord, we're so thankful for our place and the ability to get out and be together and worship you. I pray that you would speak to each one of us and uh, receive our praises, Lord, as we sing to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
want to uh, receive our morning tithes and offerings at this time. So I invite our ushers to come forward. <laughs> Father, thank you for the opportunity to participate in ministry. Pray that you would bless the uh, offerings and the tithes to your use. And bless the uh, the ones that give, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stand again as we continue singing.
Father, we do want to praise you this morning that you are holy. You are the three times holy God. You sent your son to live a perfect life and die on the cross that we might be made righteous as well. We thank you for that. I pray that you would just speak to hearts this morning, Lord. Know that you've already done that. Thank you, Lord. We just give this service to you, Lord. Whatever, whatever you want to do, we want to be obedient. Before you're seated, uh, I'll invite you if you want to participate in communion to on this side come up on the over here, on this side over here. And if there's someone near you that needs you to bring them one, please take care of that. And after you have that, you may be seated. forsaking their sins and believing in Christ for salvation are invited to participate in the death and resurrection of Christ. We come to the table that we may be renewed in life and salvation and made one by the Spirit. In unity with the church, we confess our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. And Christ will come again. Let's pray. Father, we can never praise you and thank you enough for the way of salvation, for Jesus' life and sacrifice and resurrection, Lord. For without that, we would be utterly hopeless, and we would be without any chance of anything other than eternal damnation. We thank you so much, Lord. And we understand, and we want to understand more, that it isn't because of something special about us that you chose to love us. It's because of everything about you, because we were not worthy of your love. I pray that you would help us to see that more clearly this morning, Lord. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, broken for you, preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and be thankful. Love of our Lord Jesus Christ, shed for you, preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ died for you. And be thankful. Father, we thank you for this morning's service. We thank you that we can gather. And Lord, we we thank you for those that came before us both in this local church and in other churches we thank you for our our nation Lord for the relative peace we've enjoyed all this time and Lord we think of those who this morning are facing death and destruction because of war and we pray that you would somehow intervene in that situation Lord 
I pray that you would especially be near the uh, pastors and congregations in Ukraine that are in danger. And I pray that you would encourage them and help them to know that they can stand firm for you and that you have not forgotten them. And you've called on them to walk a difficult path, Lord, and we don't always understand why, but they are not the first ones. And Lord, we want to be mindful and, and remembering to pray for them. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be considerate of uh, one another as we see needs and as we see uh, hurts, that we would lift one another up, Lord, and, and be there for one another. Draw us closer together that we might live life enough together that we can help when help is needed. And help us to be willing to share with our brothers and sisters when we need a special touch from you, something that they could help us with. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to truly love one another as you have loved us. Speak to our hearts as we look to the word and help us to understand more your uh, wonderful plan of salvation for us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> We are looking at uh, Matthew chapter 26, and today we're reading verses 57 through 68, and if you are looking in your pew Bible, that's page 1545, many of you have your own Bible, well done, and uh, I'll let you find the, the passage, Matthew 26. 57 through 68. Chapter 26 is a long one, and uh, next week we'll be wrapping that part up. <clears throat> Matthew 26, <coughs> 57 through 68. And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard, and he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He's spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you've heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, He's deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him, and others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? And the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. I was so uh, excited to be going to a big game. Indiana University, my alma mater, was playing that, that one junior college in Champaign, <laughs> and I was given tickets to this game. Now, true, it was football and not basketball, which I would have preferred, but still, I was very, very excited to go. I was given two tickets, so Rachel went as well. We, of course, wore our cream and crimson and were prepared to root the good guys on to victory. After we got there and found our seats, we discovered a couple of things. One, they were really good seats. And two, 
Well, since the person that had given me these tickets was a U of I alumnus, they were right in the middle of a sea of orange. Now, this made Rachel uncomfortable, but I was, as it says in our fight song, never daunted. I was as loud as I could possibly be, even more when at the end of that game, we won. There were cold stares of hatred <laughs> directed our way as we hurried to the car. Now, being in the land of the Philistines did not make me completely nervous because I had a pretty high level of confidence that though I might get called names, I probably was not facing death. I did feel better with Rachel there, though I'm sure she's no good in a fight. <laughs> but just knowing that someone was there with me, I was not completely alone, it helped. Don't you feel better when you have to face a difficulty if you don't have to face it alone? It just knowing someone else is there is, is better. I mean... It's always better if it just at least one other person is there to be on your side or to be by your side. Now, two weeks ago, we saw Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and we saw how it seemed like he just wanted the disciples to be close. He just wanted them to sort of be there. They weren't the most loyal of friends, as it turned out, but they were his and he felt better with them close by. Let's look at the passage from today, starting again in uh, verse 57. And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter <coughs> followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard, and he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now, Jesus had faced the scribes and the Pharisees, the chief priests and the elders. He'd faced them many times. Remember the World Heavyweight Championship we preached on? That was in the temple not that long ago. In fact, to Jesus and Caiaphas and those people, this event we're talking about right now, that other thing, that was only a week ago. It's taken us so many weeks to get here, but... In actual time, these two things are only a week apart. That was in the temple, but now Jesus is taken to see them again. This time, the battle is on their turf, the high priest's house even. And this time, well, they're all there. The high priest is there, the chief priests, the scribes, Sadducees, Pharisees, not to mention their people, their hangers-on. They'd all be there too. All of them, and one of him. No disciples, no followers, no onlookers, no neutral parties. This is definitely home court advantage for the bad guys in the truest sense of the phrase. Now we're told here that Peter followed at a distance. We've had some opinions about Peter, I suppose, in his brash ways. Over the last few weeks, we've seen some things. Peter, the boastful. Peter, the proud. Jesus told Peter that he would deny him three times on this very night. We looked at that last week. Remember, though, what Peter argued with Jesus. Oh, no, not me. No. Those other guys, you probably can't count on them. But me, I will be there for you. And yet, he wasn't. He denied Jesus. He denied Jesus, the one that he had said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. He denied that guy. Yeah, Peter could be a blowhard at times. But he did follow. I don't think we need to focus on the at a distance part right here. I mean, should he have drawn closer? Sure, sure. He should have followed closer. But where are the other disciples? Peter followed anyway. He followed. In the next couple of verses, 
um, starting with 59. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, well, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus, well, he kept silent. The assembled group had met for one reason. If you thought that that reason was to put Jesus on trial, mm, you're really only close. They hadn't really come to put Jesus on trial. They came to convict Jesus. They knew what the end result was going to be. They weren't looking for witnesses to testify, to sort of uncover the truth. No, Scripture tells us they were looking for false witnesses. Where can we find some liars that we can use for our ends? They decided a long time ago what they thought of Jesus. So this is not a trial. It's a conviction. It, I, I find it so fascinating, though, that Scripture tells us they were looking for false witnesses. They couldn't find any. I mean, it says there they found none. I mean, they couldn't find, I guess, they couldn't find two convincing liars that could agree. I would have thought that they'd have had this all worked out ahead of time. Surely they would have thought this through. But you know, I think it's true that we often give Satan way too much credit. We think he's got everything covered and he's got all, all the plans worked out and there's just no stopping him. There's no getting in his way. But so often it's not that way. Time tells that Satan doesn't always have things worked out. He's not God. Not even close. Just when the council thought that this whole thing was a flop, and just before they probably start blaming each other for the whole fiasco, they hit Peter, or at least they thought they had. Two witnesses finally agreed on a story. They claimed to have heard Jesus say that he could destroy the temple, he could rebuild it in three days. It seems kind of a yawner to me, too. And yet, the temple was the focus of power for this group that was questioning Jesus. Uh, they would not have treated that sort of thing lightly. The temple was their thing. It was their temple. And they didn't like anybody like saying bad things about it. Plus, I mean, like I said, it was only like a week ago before this very evening that Jesus had gone into that temple and, well, Scripture says, cleansed it. I don't think they looked at it as a cleansing. <laughs> I think they probably looked at it as he was messing things up. But he'd gone in there, and he'd done that, and then following that so-called cleansing was the World Heavyweight Championship, those five different debates back and forth, back and forth where they tried to catch him, and Jesus kept embarrassing these same leaders knocking down every argument they had, every trap they designed to catch him in. This temple thing would have brought all that back to mind. So now, they, now their attention's here. The high priest sees an opportunity, but Jesus doesn't cooperate. They, they said that he could do this, and Jesus, let's see, the high priest asked him, do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. If Jesus had answered this charge, well, it would have given some credence to these false witnesses. There just wasn't anything to gain for Jesus by answering them. How I need to remember Jesus' example. I think I'm not the only one. We don't have to answer back all these things. I mean, 
I think you might remember me telling you that my dad used to tell me, you don't have to say everything you think. Well, the high priest, this is verse 63, the high priest answered and said to Jesus, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, it is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. See, the, the high priest, he wanted Jesus to answer the false witnesses because he knew there was nothing in what they said. The high priest is no dummy. He knew they didn't have anything. But if this mock trial was going to proceed, it would have to be based on something that Jesus said. So they had to find a way to get Jesus to compromise himself. That's why the, the high priest says to him, aren't you going to answer anything? He wanted Jesus to say something, because then they could get that. The false witnesses really kind of bombed out. When they finally found two that could agree on something, well, that was really nothing, because Jesus wouldn't play along. I think that the, the Caiaphas must have started feeling desperate at this point, frustrated that these proceedings are really going nowhere. The high priest steps up now and he invokes God. I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. So the high priest says, listen, by God Almighty, are you the Messiah? Now, I want you to understand the word Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's not his surname. It is, a, it is a title. The word Christ and the word Messiah are the same word translated different languages. Okay? So when Jesus Christ is Jesus the Messiah. Messiah and Christ, same thing. And to the Jewish mindset of that day, it meant something different than you and I think that it means. The high priest must have thought now, finally... He'd beaten Jesus at his own game because, well, this is a no-win question for Jesus. If Jesus says yes, well, they could charge him with blasphemy. If he says no, well, then they could charge him with, like, misleading the people and pretending to be the Messiah. But again, Caiaphas never imagined Jesus answering the question with such a point-blank, well, yes. As a matter of fact, I am. But he also, th there's more to Jesus' answer than meets the eye. Because he doesn't just say, yes. When, when Caiaphas says, listen, say it now in front of God and everybody. Are you the Christ, the Son of the living God? And Jesus says, yes, I am. Just like you say. It's just like you say, Caiaphas. So he says, in a sense, well, you might say, excuse me, you might say in a sense that what Jesus has done here is he's turned the tables on the high priest, and he's saying, well, look, Caiaphas, I mean, you were looking for witnesses, and now you yourself have testified. You've, you've already claimed now that I am the Messiah. But then Jesus says more. Now, most of these members of this council like most Jewish people of that day, they were hoping for the Messiah. They were waiting on the Messiah to come. But they were looking for a Messiah that was not like maybe your understanding of who the Messiah is. But what they were looking for was someone in the line of David. In other words, a direct descendant of David, the king, with the sling, you know, and Goliath, that David. Someone that could come and sit on the throne of David, in other words, be the new king of Israel, and establish Israel again as an independent, free nation. Throw off the Romans and just be Israel. That's what they were looking for. They had no concept of the Messiah being anything other than just a man. A special man, 
a man in the line of David and all that, but just a man. That's what they thought. So when Jesus answers, quoting from Psalms and Zechariah, which is what he did when he says, you'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds and all that, he's not just claiming to be the Messiah. He's claiming to be God. In fact, Jesus as much as said here, I am standing before you in your court today. You got the home court advantage. I'm here, but someday, someday, you will see me coming in the clouds and then you will be judged by me. For now, you have home court advantage, not them. In fact, see, Caiaphas was appointed high priest. He was appointed. That's not the way that was supposed to work. They politicized everything, and plus the Romans were there. He was appointed high priest for that year. But the one that he is standing in judgment over at this very time was appointed high priest forever by God himself. Amen. So Caiaphas's little short-term, this is my year, not, it does not really stack up much. Verse 65, then the high priest tore his clothes saying, he's spoken blasphemy. What further read do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered and said, he is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face and beat him and others struck him with the palms of their hands saying, prophesy to his Christ, who is the one who struck you? The high priest might have thought himself, finally, here's one time for sure. I'm glad to hear something that Jesus has got to say. Now, he makes a big show of tearing his clothes, and he's so offended and all this, and declares that Jesus has spoken blasphemy. But he's not there, really, for anything other than to convict Jesus. So he's got to be just a little bit happy that Jesus had said this. He had to have been annoyed at these worthless false witnesses, no doubt that he paid. They gathered him up. Now he can be done with those guys. We'll get rid of them. He probably didn't even have to pay for them now. Because they didn't come through. He asserts that all of the council, all of you guys now, you heard his blasphemy. And now, they're the only witnesses they need. No more false witnesses. They heard from Jesus himself. And they all heard it. So it's time to press toward the end. He calls for sentencing, and they declare death. They had predetermined the verdict, which was a big time saver at this point. They already knew what they were going to do. That was the whole point. It wasn't, a, it wasn't in, an investigation. No, they, they knew what they thought. So that trial then, it was pretty much a mockery of any real trial. Well, then it turns into like a mob scene with the the religious leaders, the special people, the, the ones that knew how to act and how to behave and how to please God and all this, they just take turns then hitting and spitting on Jesus and mocking him. Well, this is what they'd wanted all along. They've been trying to come up with a way to catch Jesus for a while now, and now they've got him, and their home court advantage had paid off big time. But what about us? I mean, we see what they did, but does this have anything to do with us other than that it might be an interesting, sad story? In that council with Caiaphas as the high priest, as their leader, they finally had their close encounter with Jesus. They would finally come face to face with Jesus. They didn't come to Jesus. They insisted that he come to them. They didn't come with questions. They came with answers. They didn't humble themselves before him. Instead, they humbled him before themselves. They accused him of blasphemy. And then they spit on, hit, and mocked the Son of God. Everything about this encounter of theirs with Jesus was backwards. See, Jesus came to earth with a mission. He came for one reason. He came to die for the sins of men and women, and boys and girls. That's why he came. He didn't come to make your life better. 
He didn't come to heal you. He didn't come to fix your marriage, your relationships. He didn't come to help you with your finances. He didn't come for any of that. One thing. He came to die on a cross so that your sins might be forgiven Amen. by a righteous God. That's why he came. He came knowing that we could never save ourselves. He came for everybody. And since he came for everybody, he calls to everybody. Now, we don't see these encounters usually. I mean, we see some of them. But God, the Holy Spirit, is calling everyone to come to Jesus. <laughs> and he is making a way in the lives of everyone through his provenient grace, the grace that goes before. He's opening the door to Jesus. He's opening a way for you to come to Jesus. When we encounter Jesus, what will that encounter look like? Will, will we come with questions? Or will we come with answers? Will we humble ourselves and ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins and be Lord of our lives? Or will we attempt to humble him by sending him on his way empty-handed? Know this for sure. Someday, you, me, and everyone who's ever lived will stand before the judgment seat. And there, well, God has the ultimate home court advantage. At God's home court, everything follows his perfect will and his perfect law. He's made a way of escape for us, but only one. There's only one way. It's not so much that you might say it's his way or the highway. No, it's his way or eternal hell. Why would anyone ever take that route? I, I, it's inconceivable. <laughs> but for now, Jesus comes to you. In Romans 3.20, sorry, Revelation 3.20, we read, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone answers, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Jesus stands at the door. He doesn't pound on the door. <laughs> he knocks on the door. He comes to the door that's your heart. He comes to you. He comes to you. So I guess you, in that instance, have home court advantage. Unless you don't open the door. I mean, you have that option. You open the door and accept his substitutionary death for your sins, or you keep the door shut and stand in judgment over him as he walks away. That wouldn't be a victory for you, but a loss, an eternal, total loss. We hope that Jesus will come back and knock on the door again. But we don't know. I know he comes to everyone at some point in their life and knocks on the door. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to take this thing he's done Dying on the cross, shedding his blood. He wants that to apply to you. He wants that to have a benefit to you. It won't unless you open the door. It won't unless you say something along the lines of, well, I've tried it my way, and that was a bust. I need to try it your way, Jesus. See, you, there's options. I mean, you can keep going your own way. And it might be okay for today, or tomorrow, or even some years to come. Many people live their lives not opening that door. But everybody 
is going to stand in, at the judgment someday. See, so when you go to a game and you're the visitor, you can feel really alone. It was pretty lonesome when, when we, we went to that football game. I think there were about 65,000 people in orange and two in red and white. At least it seemed that way. In that situation, when you're there, you, you, you want somebody with you. See, you're going to go before Almighty God for judgment. But you don't have to be alone. Amen. If you accept Jesus now, then he will stand in your place then. So all of that, like, I just don't know what I'd say before God in the judgment. If Jesus isn't going to stand for you, I guess you can spend time thinking about what you might say, but it won't matter because it'll be all nonsense. But if Jesus will stand in your place, you don't have to say anything. Jesus will have, Jesus has already been judged and found righteous. Jesus has already lived a perfect life and he shed his blood so that that could be applied to you. If that's the case, well then, you won't be a visitor there. And you'll get to share the ultimate home court advantage. I'm so glad that when I was 16 years old, I came to a place where I quit running from God. And I quit trying to do things the way that had been, I'd been doing them. I quit trying to be the smart one and coming up with all my own plans. And I quit going to bed at night fearful that I might not wake up and I knew exactly what would happen to me if I didn't. And that summer when I was 16 in a July at an altar that was on that side of the church right about there, I knelt and I asked God to forgive me. Jesus had been knocking and I finally answered that door. And I said, please come in. And Jesus forgave me of my sins. And he turned my life completely around. I don't know how many people at church saw a big difference in me because I was a good pretender. I've told you about my parents before. My mother saw to it that I acted the part, whether I was the part or not. I was a good pretender. But I know there were other people that could see a difference. I'm sure there were people who on the previous Thursday or Friday or Saturday had talked to me and might have heard me say a lot of things that after that Sunday they never heard me say again. Things that I had wanted to do, I didn't do anymore. Things that I, places I'd wanted to go, I didn't go anymore. Jesus set me on a path that led in a direct line from that place at that altar to the judgment seat where I knew he was going to stand for me. And I didn't have to say, okay, what, what am I going to say when I get there? I don't have any idea. Why don't I say anything now? Because I know, because I've accepted the Lord's forgive, for, offer of forgiveness, I know that when God looks at me standing there, he's going to say, you remind me of Jesus. <laughs> when I see you, I, I see, I, you just smell like Jesus. You look like Jesus. Everything about you think, just reminds me of Jesus. It won't be because I learned how to behave myself. It won't be because I, well, I did a few things and then I took other things and I didn't do. And finally, the scales tipped in my favor. It won't be because of any of that. It'll be because I knelt at an altar. It doesn't have to be a physical altar, but I knelt in front of Jesus and I said, I cannot save myself. And I know that I need to be saved. I know that I need forgiveness. I have sinned against you. And there is no excuse and no payment possible. And Jesus said, I got your payment. He said, I got you. I got you. I did that. And now we can agree. You're needy, and we both know it. I'm righteous. We both know. What a deal. What a fantastic deal. 
just to accept his offer and be forgiven. Just to accept his offer and to be righteous in his eyes. I can never be righteous on my own. I mess up. You might not see it because I'm still a pretty good pretender. But if you were in my head with me, you'd know there are reasons why Jesus, I mean, really, that, that Jesus and God, I'll say, you know what, it, we tried it. it. It was nice for a while, but no, you don't measure up. And I still don't measure up. But I still don't have to worry about that because Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Friend, I will tell you, if you have things in your heart and you've been trying to make this happen on your own, if you've been trying to make sure you do enough good things to outweigh the bad things, maybe it's time to forget all that nonsense because you can't ever do it. You can never be sure. Maybe it's time to just accept Jesus' offer and open that door and say, you know what, I'm, I'm ready to humble myself before you. I can't save myself. Maybe today's that day. I mean, you could leave here and, and send Jesus on his way, and I suppose maybe he might come again and not. I wouldn't want to take that chance. You have everything to gain and nothing to lose except your pride. Let's pray. Father, I know in a congregation this big, there have to be some people who need to humble themselves, who need to accept what you have done for their lives. Some people that have been trying to make sure that the good outweighs the bad. And I'm going to come and do a little church thing here, and that will make up for what happened last week. Lord, help them to know that there is no making up for that. If we sin, we deserve death. If we ever sin, we deserve death. Even one sin, we deserve death. And we cannot pay it back. We cannot pay the price. But you did. You paid that price for us. Lord, if there's anyone here that's hearing you knock on the door of their heart this morning, or give them the grace to respond to you. Let them humble themselves before you this morning, Lord, and not insist that you humble yourself and walk away in the knock on the door and you know the people are inside but they won't open the door and you just feel funny and bad. I've done that. Walking away from the porch and you wonder if anybody saw you knocking or help us not to send you away. I just pray that you would speak to hearts, Lord. Give people another chance. If they're going to send you away this morning, Lord, be merciful to them more than they deserve. If you'd like to come forward and pray, this would be a good place to do that. There's people here that care about you that can help you pray. this morning. Thank you that as we see this sad occasion of Jesus standing there, we know what the end of the story is. And we know that he is going to come back on the clouds. And I know that we can look forward to his return with excitement. There are those that have put off 
that door, I pray that you would be with them, Lord, and speak to them, heal kindly with them. Bring them to you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.